And a parking meter. Yeah. It's a no quarter, this car only. I'm fooling around with the car. I have no idea how to do it. Sure. <laughs> it's broken. Mm. So I have to put the meter. Yeah. Well, it's so we're recording right now, so don't say anything they don't want on camera. Uh, hello, Internet. Where does that leave me? So today, um, given that we left off about two-thirds of the way through 1 Corinthians, and we could continue the, the Bible study in exile theory, you know, arc, but since some of you weren't here for the online thing, and we were two-thirds of the way through a letter, I figured let's do something we know we can finish in a day. So we're going to do the shortest Pauline epistle, Philemon. So you can look that up. Um, it's also pronounced Philemon by some, but to me that sounds like a Jamaican guy talking about how great a buffet can be, the little Philemon. But, <laughs> no Spanish uh, <laughs> <laughs> You're not paying for the humor. Um, anyway, so Philemon, um, which is an interesting letter, and, it, and even though it's all of 25 verses, so I know we can get through that within 10 years, um, I think there's a lot of deep... Um, and rich material here that could be worth considering. So it's before Hebrews. So Hebrews is a much bigger letter. So if you're looking through your Bible, just find Hebrews and then go right before it. Um, and sorry, we don't have Bibles here again. That's part of the St. Mary, St. Joseph's adjustment. So we'll figure out what this looks like in the weeks to come. Okay? Everyone good and happy? We can start with a prayer when everyone's ready. I know if you're flipping around. It's not super fun. And if you're from the same household, you can sit together. That said, maybe you want a break and want to sit six feet apart. That's fine, too. You know, no judgment from me. But, you know, I would figure, you know, you might appreciate each other's company. But, you know, you're, <laughs> and you probably appreciate the break, too. Um, okay, well, why don't we start with a prayer and go from there, okay? And then maybe we'll just touch base on how everyone's been doing the past six months. Miserable is a, an acceptable answer. And <laughs> we'll get to work. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessings of this day, and we ask that you open our minds and enlighten our hearts to come to a better knowledge of your word, whether in long form or here in, in a more abbreviated way, that with and considering this short letter from Paul, we may get the point, that we may ruminate over it and come to see the full depth of meaning and reach and scope that it ultimately has for us. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord, whom we pray as he taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Our Lady of Sorrows, pray for us. Saint Joseph, pray for us. Saint Paul, pray for us. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Okay. So how's everybody doing? Pretty well. No complaints. Do I need to complain? No. I think I need it. I don't know. I, I, I'm on camera, so I better behave. I'm worried about passing out, but honestly, that would probably be a break for you all, so we'll see. Okay? So, hi, Internet world. Sorry I'm not looking directly at you. Just, yeah, hope, I hope I cut my sideburns up evenly enough today. You'll, you, you can tell me later. Okay, so we're looking at Philemon here, which is an interesting letter for a variety of reasons. Um, so it's very short. That makes it very interesting, especially for people who want to run through the Bible. You know, if you ever make a resolution to read all the books of the Bible, it might be good to start with some of these shorter ones so you, you get a bit of an ego boost. It's like, oh, I finished a whole book of the Bible today. Okay, it could have been written on a postcard, but yeah, you, you read a whole book of the Bible, fine. 73 books in all, and about four or five of them are about this long. One prophet in the Old Testament is about 40 verses, and two of Paul's letters are about this long, and so on. So it's short. What else is interesting about the letter to Philemon? Well, beyond the theme, there's also the fact that it's from what we call the captivity period. He makes allusion to being in prison in the midst of the letter, right? Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother. 
That's the first verse. So the idea that we can recognize how this is written at a time where Paul is in prison. It's unclear where. Possibly it's Rome, which would put this in the early 60s. Possibly it's in Ephesus, where he spent many years and could well have been in prison there. That would put it in the mid-50s. But regardless, you, you have this sense of it being linked to Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. All of those talk of Paul being in prison. In Philippians, there's that beautiful line, though I'm in prison, the word of God is not bound. And so there's that sense that, um, you know, even, even in prison, Paul has considerable reach through these letters in part, but also just through the truth of the gospel and the connection in Christ. This is interesting, too, because, again, Philemon is so short, you would wonder, and it's so specific, it doesn't exactly settle a particular argument of general interest. So again, there's a lot of scholarship, especially in the latter half of the 20th century, that will try to go through and say, well, Paul wrote this, he didn't write this, he wrote this, he didn't write that. The awkward thing about a letter like this is it's so short, who would make this up? Why, you know, it's the equivalent of like forging a letter in John Paul II's name where he arranges to get hoagies for the cardinals. That's the kind of scope we're talking about here. Now, this is a much more significant topic, but we're talking about something so small. Like, why would you make that up? Why, you know, again, there are arguments, say, for understanding Second Peter, say, as possibly not written by St. Peter. There's an argument there, and it's a real argument. Um, and there is a tradition of, in our day, you know, we have things like, um, what's that word? Plagiarism. They didn't have plagiarism. And in fact, they almost had the opposite problem. You didn't take other people's work and pass it off as your own. And that day, often, to get currency, you took someone famous and wrote something in their name. So the Wisdom of Solomon, one of the last books of the Old Testament, is attributed to Solomon. But no one, no one believes it was actually written by Solomon. And we have to understand that in terms of genre. It's not misleading you. It's rather that this person is attributing this wisdom to someone like Solomon. So anyway, when we look at this letter, though, it's clearly nothing like that. This is something that's clearly a nuts and bolts letter with deep theological meaning. But it's also linked to letters that scholars are tempted to dismiss, like Ephesians and Colossians, where they say, oh, St. Paul didn't write this. But... Philemon mentions many of the same characters as are raised in Colossians, for example. Um, one in particular is Archippus, who's mentioned in the second verse. And so I like to think, and again, you, I don't think you can establish this conclusively, but I think Philemon gives you reason to think that much of the rest of the Pauline corpus, much of the rest of the letters of St. Paul, are reliable. Because either they invented this letter to make those letters look good, which seems stupid, or this is a true letter, and it has resonance to other true letters. Hey, Lee, how you doing? Fine. Just know that you're on camera, okay? Okay. okay so, so don't say the offensive things you usually say. <laughs> <laughs> hey, kids, sorry. That's not true, Internet, okay? He's an upstanding guy. For all I know. Make sure that you are on Oh, I'm on it. They, I you do? Know, yeah, oh. I, I am too. I mean, I'm seeing my sideburns, but whatever. It works. Okay, so that's kind of the thing. So we have a short letter. It almost certainly seems real. It's linked to letters that are somewhat controversial. There, you know, no one disputes Philippians, but many of pe many people dispute Colossians and, and Ephesians, and so it gives some turf and some firepower to the idea that those letters are in fact written by Paul, which is pretty awesome. Okay, why don't we go through that? Okay, and we'll have. I, I would volunteer to have people read like we normally do, but then I'm going to basically have to read it back to the camera. So. Uh, I'm sorry, but you're just going to have to hear more of my, my melodious voice. Okay, let's just do the first section I have from verse 1 through 3 as the first section. Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Fairly straightforward, and if you've been in our class back in the fall, we went through the standard epistolary format, that unlike our letters, which start with who, to whom it's addressed, these letters start with who's sending it. And so that's what we get, right? The return address is basically right at the top. Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus. And again, it's debated if this is in Rome in the 60s or in Ephesus in the 50s. I think most traditional scholars would back Rome, that this is toward the end of his career. To Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier. Again, I established that Archippus is referenced in Colossians. So again, people like to think Colossians is something that was attributed by one of Paul's disciples to Paul. 
but it gets a bit awkward when it mentions some of the very same people that are in a, an undisputed Pauline letter like this. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, the standard wish for health made into spiritual health is a standard greeting. Okay? We're good so far? Let's go four through seven. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers because I have heard of your love and of the faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus and all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may promote the knowledge of all the good that is ours in Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. So again, many of his letters go from this wish of greeting to a thanksgiving, right? Paul, I think it's good human psychology in general, but it's also good pastoral practice. You start with what you like about people. <laughs> you don't immediately go to what, what you're going to complain about. Now, you may remember there's one letter in, in Paul's collection that doesn't do that. Anyone remember which one that is? Where he just goes right into complaining? It's Galatians. In Galatians, they're going pretty far. So he wishes them well, and then he says, I'm amazed that you're so quickly abandoning what we handed on to you. <laughs> so he's making it clear, hey, normally I'd be polite, but this is pretty um, difficult here. So here, though, I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers, because I hear of your love and of the faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus and all the saints. And I pray, and again, saints here doesn't mean the saints glorified in heaven. It means um, the Christians on earth who are holy. And, I, and it, of course, it means the Christians in heaven as well, but it, it's primarily referring to those who, who share the faith in the world. So, hence the next verse. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may promote the knowledge of all the good that is ours in Christ. So this idea, and, and we're going to see where, where this comes in later, but this idea that sharing the faith promotes knowledge of all good. There's this sense of community, there's this sense of unity, there's this sense of common witness and faith. And all of these are going to be brought to bear when the issue at hand comes up, which is a lot more important than John Paul II buying hoagies for the College of Cardinals. But it's a very small question with very wide-ranging implications. Verse 7, I've derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of all the saints have been refreshed through you. Um, hearts here literally translates to bowels, which is more the way you use it in, in the Aramaic or the ancient Near Eastern way. But it means hearts. It's basically that. We're not talking about good digestion here. Um, but this is, this is there in part to see that this fraternity really is meant to vivify the spirit and build us up. And just like, well, you all have braved the pandemic to be here today, knowing that um, this is better in person for whatever reason. It's better to be here together going through this than, than going through it on your own. So, you know, I, I think we have a sense of that all the more vividly than we would have six months ago. Okay, so why don't we get to the matter at hand? Okay, and this is the body of the letter, basically. Accordingly, verse 8, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake I prefer to appeal to you. So again, Paul has this authority. He has the authority to command. But he also has the good psychology to know that commanding often leads to resistance, rejection, passive, <laughs> what is it? My sister was telling me about the line. She's in the school system in New York, and there's all these ridiculous requirements with what they have to do to keep the kids safe. Again, she's not anti-keeping the kids safe. It's that a lot of the things they're suggesting don't actually do all that much other than cover liability. Sound familiar? Anyway. Um... But the idea of, uh, what did she call it, malicious compliance, the idea that you abide by something but it's so unreasonable and you're actually kind of undermining things in the long run. Uh, so she was walking that term through. Not that she has any particular designs that are actionable in a court, but that, um, you know, it's, it's a real fact of life. And so again, Paul is wise enough to know that while he can command, for love's sake, he prefers to appeal to you. And so there is this idea, right? And I think... We misunderstand it in our age where we talk about the authority of the apostles, the authority of the bishops. But their authority is meant to be shown in love. And part of the idea of having authority is that it not be used in that way. Remember, Christ, con Christ condemns those who make their authority felt. That doesn't mean there are times where that has to there, there aren't times where that has to be done. There are times where you have to put your foot down. But generally, the best leaders, there's that wonderful line of Margaret Thatcher that being in charge is like being a lady. Um, that if you have to insist, you aren't. And the sense she's meaning it in, of course, is that there's there's an air and a graciousness that kind of comes with it. And, and, it, and it's not just like being a lady. You know, you're insisting on it rudely. 
you're not exactly building up the dynamic you're fostering. And if in leadership, you're insisting that people obey your whims, it doesn't really lead to leadership, rather it leads to something a bit less than leadership, even if you have to feed in charge. So for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an ambassador, and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus. Okay? So we have that line. Let's see what some of these say. I have my Jewish study Bible here, which is pretty awesome. It's a New Testament. Um, okay, we'll have a bit on that in a moment. Okay. I have my um, Spanish Navarre Bible. And it, it also doesn't really have anything yet. Okay. So let's get back to it. Let's go with um, what we can say. Which is this. Again, the idea that Paul's an ambassador. The idea that the apostles really are sent, right? That's what the word itself means. And that apostleship entails a degree of mediation. A mediation between the will of Christ and the life of the believer. Not that, again, the apostles are meant to run the lives of believers, but that they are, in speaking in their authority, meant to convey in love, are meant to convey the pattern and sweep of life. And that when we hear them, we're meant to hear Christ through them. Just as we are meant to hear it with the bishops, just as we're meant to hear it at Mass, just as we're meant to hear it from one another, right? Bear one another's burdens that you might fulfill the law of Christ. This idea that the Christian is really, he's only really intelligible and only really makes sense when he resembles Christ. And that's what we're meant to be from one another. Okay, so where's he going to go with it? Well, maybe you've read ahead and you know, but I appeal to you now for my child Onesimus, which literally means useful, and we'll see in a minute what that has to go with. Oh, one, one minute about ambassador. Just, this is interesting. So, um, Scott Hahn's study here points out that the term ambassador here can also refer to an elderly man, someone in his early to mid-50s, or possibly older. Sorry if you're a bit older than 50. But this idea, I mean, at that time, being in your 50s was a big deal. I guess it still kind of is. Um, but this idea, then, that ambassador reflects this idea of, of mediation, but in the sense of, of a seniority, right? That you, you look, we all look to the old, not in a patronizing way, hopefully, but, you know, again, I'm 33, and I know I'm sucking all the oxygen out of this room right now, um, so I'm not making the best example of it. But, hey, you know, you can put as many letters after my name or as many titles before my name as I want, but strictly speaking, I have to be ready to hear you know, those who have gone before and have plenty of experience, right? And if I expect you to hear what I have to say, and if I expect to have anything worth hearing, I probably got that from other people who have already lived through it. <laughs> so there's this idea then that being an ambassador for Christ, um, while it involves Christ, it also, in this illusion, in, involves his age. Paul is speaking in his maturity on this issue. And he's speaking as one who is an elder in a proper sense. And that degree of, of how elders govern the church was, was a wise one. There was a wise provision to that. The idea that you need a few years, you need the dust to settle on your sins or on, on your early life of conversion to get a sense of things. So there's that as well. Okay. I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I have become in my imprisonment. Now this idea of becoming his father, we're not talking about legal adoption here, but rather we're talking about what Paul alludes to, I think, in Corinthians when we were going through it. It's, you have, you have had many preach to you, but only one father. And it is I who have begotten you in the gospel, right? St. Paul says that in his authority. And I think we alluded to that, that he was speaking to the Corinthians. This is the first letter of the Corinthians we were going through, and when a bit of a flu came through and, and shut down our study. But he was alluding to how there are many divisions and there are many people you can be inspired by, but there is this fatherhood in Christ that comes through the preaching of the gospel. And so to become Onesimus' father implies that Onesimus has come to the faith or, or has been reconfigured in the faith and welcomed by him. Again, we're not fully clear on the details of, of who Onesimus was. There is a tradition that he became a bishop, I think, in Crete or Cyprus. One of those two. I think it was Crete. After, after all this went down. But the wide understanding is that he was a slave of Philemon, that he was the property of Philemon who fled from him and was found by Paul and came to the fullness of Christianity in exile. And so in coming back to the faith and in returning to St. Paul, and ultimately in being sent back to his former master Philemon, 
that's going to be the dynamic we're dealing with today, which is one that I think in our age of, of considering social questions and systematic oppression, I think this letter navigates it quite well in, in a way of pointing out a better way that I think even our society could deal with a bit better. Okay, so he's become his father in imprisonment, presumably through the preaching of the gospel. Verse 11, formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useless, useful to you and me. Again, his name meaning useful. And so formerly he was useless to you. That probably alludes to the fact that there was some falling out or misunderstanding in, in his domestic service there. Now let's take a look at this Jewish study Bible because it has a bit on slavery in the Roman Empire. So on the whole, what we're talking about is a form of slavery that, at least in the Roman sense, involved absolute control of life and death over, over a slave. Um, now, slaves did have some rights in some circumstances, probably better than slaves in the American South were treated, but there were real issues. And again, even family structures in the Roman Empire, I mean, the pater familias, the head of a family, had life and death power over his own children. If they, if they really ticked him off, he could have them put to death. I mean, <laughs> that's a bit of a distortion, too, a bit. <laughs> um, so, anyway. Although some, especially Stoics, wrote of the fundamental humanity of slaves and advocated they be treated humanely, none rejected the institution. Roman slavery was not race-based. Individuals were enslaved primarily through captivity and war or birth to a slave mother. Slaves could be freed and become Roman citizens. Nevertheless, Roman slaves lived with the possibility of losing their families and with physical violence or threat of it. Okay, so we have this sense then where you have a long-standing institution, and you have a minority of a minority. Again, Christians were a minority among Jews, and many Jews would argue they were no longer Jews. Um, and they were in no position to change this institution. And so it's interesting how St. Paul is going to navigate this. So again, Onesimus, useless as a slave, and so presumably running away, but now useful to you and to me. Useful to Paul because he's come to the gospel, and useful to Philemon too, and we're going to see how. Philemon, his former master. Verse 12. I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I prefer to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but by your own free will. So this is interesting, right? Notice all the different strands that are kind of coming up here, right? I'm sending him back to you, sending you, sending my very heart. Paul has identified this closely with this man. This man that Philemon would be very tempted to look down upon, who presumably was deeply disappointed with his service or whatever. Maybe he was a bad master. That could easily be believable. But Paul identifies so closely with him. Who does that remind you of? Paul's another Christ, right? And so this whole letter can become an analogy. How Paul treats Onesimus is how Christ looks at and treats us that God might see and love in us what he sees and loves in his son. It's a beautiful line from one of the prefaces of the Mass. And I think we have to be ready to see that, that you know, when, when Paul in, in Galatians talks about how there are no, there's no male or female, no Jew nor Greek, he's not saying that you suddenly cease to be Greek or cease to be Jewish or cease to be male or cease to be female. He's saying rather that the individual characteristics of our lives are trumped by the reality of, God, of Christ's transformation in us, that it no longer be we who live, but Christ who lives in us. And that doesn't deny all the differences that are real, but it resituates them and re-anchors them for us in what is even more fundamental than our own identity. And again, that's not to deny or erase or eradicate our own identity, but it's to recast it. And again, we live in an age now where, heaven forbid, you take issue with, I don't know, growing up an Italian-American Catholic in Bensonhurst, having spent six months in the Philippines doing mission. Like, you can, you can string along an identity as long as you like, and if someone else kind of rolls their eyes at it because of how long it tend, the description tends to get, well, then suddenly you're a, a hateful person who rejects the identity of the one right in front of them. Now, look, I'm not after anybody with that. I'm just saying that there's, even, there's something even deeper to us than the identity we've come to assume for ourselves, right? Have I told you all? This story is really good. I love this story. Did I bring up in Bible study the story of the Archbishop of Canterbury? Did I tell you about this? Anyone, any of you? So the current Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, he's been in about almost 10 years now, maybe a little less. So he, he was installed as Archbishop of Canterbury, and within short order of his being installed, 
of, as head of the Anglican Communion, or, or I guess head of the Church of England, whatever. They know the terms, I don't know. But rumors quickly began to circulate that the man who was his father wasn't actually his father. Odd rumor to go around, and not exactly the thing you hear about an archbishop when he gets in, but that's the rumor that was swirling around. And the United Kingdom has a much stronger, this is a really patriotic way of saying, they have a much stronger system of tabloids than we do. <laughs> they have a lot more, you know, we have the New York Post and the Daily News, and then it kind of drops off from there. So you can argue they're all tabloids now. But the ones that we call tabloids <coughs> are few in number. In the UK, there's a lot more. And one of these tabloid newspaper reporters went to Justin Welby, at least to his office, and, and expressed this rumor to him and said, you know, what do you think of this? Do you have anything to respond? He goes, oh, that's ridiculous. That's, you know, there's no basis in fact with this. And so the, the guy went, well, are you willing to take a DNA test to back it up? And he said, well, sure. <laughs> and so I'm telling you the story, so you can probably predict what happened. He took the DNA test and it established that the man that gave him the name Welby wasn't actually his father. And his mother, who was in her mid, in, who was in her mid nineties um, at the time, and still alive, uh, had to go through this somewhat publicly. That um, there was an adulterous union that present, and again, there were difficulties in that marriage. And he was raised by the man who wasn't his father. The marriage stayed intact amidst the difficulties, and he was raised by that man. And so now you have the Archbishop of Canterbury, <laughs> and had the dynamics of his family life in full public view in front of the whole country. And so he came up with a statement that I thought was absolutely wonderful. Well, that's why I bring it up, right? And so he said, you know, it's come to my attention that um, some of the details of, of my past and of my family's life are very different than what I would have known. But for me, this changes nothing. Being baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and being united and incorporated into Christ Jesus, this doesn't change a thing about who I am. I'm a son of God. And the man who raised me is my father. The woman who raised me is my mother. And he, he went on to say a few other very gracious things. But that's basically the line he took. And I think whatever we find that we're dealing with, I think that's kind of the answer we have to be ready to echo to. I, I think that um, what St. Paul is providing for here or in Galatians or in his whole view of being transformed in Christ is something that speaks against the, the self-cobbled together or the self-identification that our age has been linked to inextricably. Okay. And so what does that allow us to do, though? What does taking that attitude allow us to do? Well, let's see what Paul does with that. You know, dealing with a very oppressive institution, someone who had been oppressed, but maybe had his own share of sins, too, like anyone, and, and looking for reconciliation in the face of all of that and unity in Christ. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. So again, I'm sending him back to you, sending my own part, the idea that Paul identifies so closely with. Next verse, right, which I just read. I would have been glad to keep him here with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. Think of what he's doing there. He's alluding to the fact that this was his slave. You know, if he stays here and works for me, he's serving me on your behalf. So he's taking that slavery dynamic and putting it into the context of serving the gospel, right? Not, not going after it and saying, well, let's, let's tease out every issue that this entails. This is what I'm saying. Well, and, and, and there's a bit of irony to it too, right? The, the fact is that he's there serving Paul because he chose to do that. <laughs> and so if you let him live his life, he's serving on your behalf. See what he's doing with the categories there? It's pretty cheeky. But I prefer to do nothing without your consent. So think of the rights that he would have under Roman law to claim this person back as property. I would claim nothing. I would, I prefer to do nothing without your consent. Yeah, so he's covering himself legally. And he's also inviting well, what exactly are you willing to consent to in this situation? In order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own free will. So just as at the beginning, he said, I'm not going to come down on you and tell you what to do, that it might come out of love and not authority. So here, I'm doing nothing without your consent, so that what you could insist on by right, you won't. And that you, by free will, do the charitable thing that would, re that would reflect how... You, I, and Onesimus have been reconfigured in Christ. Interesting, no? Very interesting. <clears throat> Verse 15. Perhaps this is why he was parted for, from you for a while. Don't you love that, why he was parted from you? You notice that a lot of apologies today, or maybe when you've had to make an apology, things suddenly shift to the passive voice. You know, mistakes were made, not I made a mistake. You know, perhaps this is why he was parted from you, not this is why he departed from you. This is why he was parted from you. 
It's, it's passive. You take away the responsibility for a bit. <laughs> and again, there are times where that hides the reality, but there are times where you're shelving the question of guilt and innocence and focusing on something even deeper. Perhaps this is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever. No longer as a slave, but more than a slave, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord? Both in the flesh. Hmm? Yeah, that's an interesting point. Both in the flesh. Yeah, both in the flesh. What is that about? I don't know. Why don't we look into that? So the question was, what about this thing of him being related in the flesh? So, yeah, so the use of the term brother to refer to a slave who is also a community member appears as well in Deuteronomy 15. The latter mandates that a Hebrew slave after six years of servitude must be freed in the seventh year. So there's a sense that Paul could be building on this Jewish tradition. Again, the Jews made a distinction. Maybe if you saw the um, in online Bible study last week, you might have heard this. Um, the Jews made a distinction between Hebrew slaves. You could sell yourself into slavery, and people often did because it was either that or starve. And again, we say, oh, well, we're so much better. But there are plenty of Filipino housemate, you know, house workers in this country who are brought over by things. Or, you know, there are plenty of them, you know, plenty of people in South Asia who go and work in Saudi Arabia. And I'm not saying they're slaves in the sense that American slaves in the South or Roman slaves were, but they don't exactly dictate their hours either. You know what I mean? They make a deal and they give up considerable freedoms um, for the financial gain. And I'm not trying to make use that to make light of slavery or human trafficking, but I'm just saying there's a spectrum here, right? Um, in one of the parishes I volunteered at, the, the housekeeper actually, um, her status was unclear because she had been brought over to this country by a, a diplomatic family. And again, she had basically been imprisoned basically and forced to work unreasonable hours and eventually fled. And she was working at this parish to make ends meet. So all I'm saying is, where does the line of human trafficking and, and sacrificing your freedoms start? I don't say that to downplay the reality of slavery. I'm saying that when we consider all economic injustice, we understand that there are ways you can approach that even now. You can have the lawyer making $100,000 a year or two hundred, three hundred $300,000 a year, but is working 90-hour weeks. We call it golden handcuffs. Now, I'm not equating those things, but I am saying we call them handcuffs for a reason. There is, a, there is a restriction there. Not that we ought to cry too much over that guy. He is choosing that. But, you see what I'm saying? There are plenty of unjust economic relationships out there. And that's not to deny the, the reality of particularly heinous ones. But in identifying how those trends go, we can see that it's not just there that we need to be vigilant. Okay. So, what about this whole brother thing that you brought up? Fair enough. Um... I wonder, again, I'm going, I'm engaging in gossip here, I guess, but it is 2,000 years later, so I guess it's more academic speculation. If it were, if it were around us now, it would be gossip. Maybe, maybe he has some relation to the family, you know? <laughs> is he a slave because Philemon's father fathered this kid with, with a slave woman? I, I don't know. I'm, I wasn't there. Um, and I'm not, I'm not accusing him. Um, I don't want to go through that legal process, okay, for someone who's been dead for 2,000 years. I don't have the time. But you know what I'm saying. I wonder if that's even being alluded to. But we don't know. But this idea of calling a slave a brother in, in at least uh, alludes to this idea from Deuteronomy that was, was there. Both in the flesh and in the Lord. I wonder, too, if in the flesh could also just mean... On the same, same text, same town, or same family, relative? Yeah, I mean, that's one potential thing. But also in the flesh could also mean that he's more present to you now than he was. Something like that. You know, maybe it's in that sense. Again, I'll have to look into that, because it's an interesting expression, and I've never really thought about it all that much. Well, I have a little commentary here on yeah. my app, and it says, verse 16, no longer as a mere servant or a slave, and in quotation it says, uh, though still he is that, but above the servant, so that thou shall derive from him not merely the service of the slave, but higher benefits, a servant in the flesh, he is a brother in the Lord. Interesting. Okay. So they're kind of taking that verse and then applying it to the two parallels. Right. That's interesting. So I don't know if Internet World heard that, but basically this idea that that verse, um, more than a slave as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh as a slave, but in the Lord 
as a brother. So in that sense, internet world. Uh, Larry, did you have a point? I didn't want to cut you off. Well, I, I think that's what I was going to say, that it may just mean his physical presence. Yeah. I'm sending him back to you. And he's also now in the Lord yeah. as your brother in Christ. Yeah. Okay. So again, I, I apologize for basically just saying what you just said, but for internet world's sake. <laughs> okay. Man, internet world, I hope you don't feel guilty about this. We're not trying to guilt you. Well, I am. No one else here does that. Um, but no, this idea that in the flesh could mean being in person. And, and you can thank Larry for that. That's not my fault. Okay. Keep going? Let's keep going. So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. So this alludes back to that idea, right? That Paul's brotherhood, the fraternity of St. Paul as apostle and as brother and as partner in the gospel, means that, well, he's basically putting in a personal recommendation here, right? Receive him as you would receive me. There's that degree of closeness here that's meant to be shown. And so Paul's putting it all out there, but again, not by compulsion. And again, I think we live in an age where we're content to simply, if, if people toe the line outwardly, it means that we've won the victory inwardly. I don't think St. Paul's willing to settle for that. He's looking for something far more reaching here. Which again, he's not going to overturn slavery in his lifetime, and he doesn't intend to. But in a sense, and again, you can make the argument, especially when you think that the abolition movement was led by Christians in the United Kingdom, and that was the primary force that brought the end of slavery in most of the world. You can make the argument that St. Paul actually did it by playing a longer game. I, I think you can make that argument. It involved tolerating a lot of evil for a lot of time, but you know who else tolerates a lot of evil for a lot of time? I said God, but subtly. Okay. Um, so if you would consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it, to say nothing of your owing me, even your own self. <laughs> to say nothing of it, but he's going to bring it up. So this idea, again, Paul is ready to pay the account. Like who? Christ. Okay, that analogy continues. And so if he owes you anything, charge that to me. Christ suffered for you to set you an example. You were redeemed not by perishable things like silver and gold, but the, the, by the blood of Christ, beyond all price. I think that's St. Peter, actually, not St. Paul, but hey, they, they colluded, so that's fine. Now, this is interesting, right? We've seen this in other letters. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it. So, commonly, Paul would have a secretary. He'd have someone writing on his behalf, because why would you, have some, why would you write it yourself? You'd be generally dictating. But Paul here is basically saying, look, this is me. Here's the blank check. <laughs> you know, here's my signature on the bottom of said blank check. Okay? That's the equivalent of saying I write in my own hand. I'm not going to hide behind a secretary here. I'm, this is my own hand. And presumably, since um, uh, Philemon has the first copy, he could verify that it was Paul's handwriting. So I write this. I will repay it. To say nothing of your owing me, even your own self. So again, Paul, Paul's not afraid to allude to the fact that, the, you know, what, what Christ promises us, right? He who saves his life will lose it. He who loses his life for my sake will find it. And for any of us reclaimed and redeemed in the gospel, we are more in possession of ourselves and sacrificing ourselves than we ever were in picking our own priorities. And so he's not afraid to say, well, I've freed you enough that you should be ready to free others, or at least be ready to welcome them back as brothers. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. So this idea again of refreshing one's heart, we saw that at the beginning, right, of how how good and pleasant it is for brothers to live in unity. The idea, and I think we felt it more acutely these past six months, of what separation entails and what it costs, and how the presence of another can be so refreshing for so many of us, even just over the little stupid things we talk about, or that I bring up, but that even in that dynamic, that presence, we are really refreshed, provided that we're engaging with each other in an edifying way. And St. Paul's basically saying, well, if you're going to use social dynamics to justify enslavement, why aren't you using social dynamics to justify those relationships and, and actions that really do refresh us, right? Refresh my heart by being generous to this man who you are admittedly ticked off on, and Roman law acknowledges that you have the right to be ticked off at. In fact, it, it acknowledges even worse. 
But if you insist on your rights, you, you undermine any basis by which you could be refreshed or find this refreshing. 21. Confident of your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. Again, go past the sale. <laughs> go past the sale and, and make it about that invitation and proposition. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I'm hoping through your prayers to be granted to you. So this idea, I hope to stop in. And we know that this reflects Paul's personality perfectly. We saw this in the letter to the Romans, where he basically wrote to Rome in part to make his introduction in hopes that when he stopped in on his way to Spain, they would receive him, right? He hadn't been to Rome yet when he wrote the letter to the Romans. We, we talked about that. And so in part, it was his introduction to that community. Um, and so here, he's, he's preparing his way. And again, when you're an itinerant, um, I mean, I do it plenty. There are plenty of thank you cards I send out because I hope I'm going to stay in that rectory in six months. There's more to it than that, but that's in my mind. I hope that's not too, you know, a mercenary. You can tell me later if it is. But I'm generally there for good reasons, and I don't cause too much damage. Um, so there's the one time, though. I probably shouldn't bring this up, but whatever. <laughs> I was staying with a priest friend of mine in the Bronx, a lovely parish, and a wonderful priest of the Archdiocese of New York. And uh, I put the shower on, and and the, the, the valve just totally disassembled, and, and it was just running constantly. And the poor guy had to spend three or four hours getting the plumber and everything together. And uh, I didn't do it. It was broken. That was not me. But you see, you see what people put up with to show hospitality. And that's, you know, you've got to prepare them for that, too. And you, you, you've got to follow up with them, too. Now he has a parish with Italian mass, so I offered to come and say mass for him there. We'll see if I can get down there. Stay tuned. Uh, but probably he won't let me take a shower. Okay. 23. Epaphras, my beloved, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you, and so do Mark, Aristarchus, Damas, and Luke, my fellow workers. Do you recognize any of these names? Yeah. Like who? Mark. Yeah, you recognize Mark, right? Aristarchus. Yeah, you remember Aristarchus? Demas. Yeah. Luke. Yeah, Luke's fairly, yeah, that's one easy, that's easy to pick up on. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, we, we, got the, we got the whole gang here. It's, you know, it's the little rascals. No, it's, it's the apostolic band around St. Paul. Mm -hmm. And so to, to see that that not only includes the social dimension of keeping in touch and showing that people keep each other in mind, but it also leads them to share in the dynamic of the ministry. I mean, think of how many times you send out an email and you CC someone else on the email to make sure that they're in the loop, to make sure that it's clear that they're part of this conversation. And so St. Paul's doing this here. Um, Probably also to back it up to say, hey, if you don't follow through on this and I kick the bucket, well, these five people are going to be asking you too. <laughs> That's there too. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Okay. Amen. Amen. Um, so a, a common and, and fairly direct ending for a relatively short letter. Um, Interesting point in, um, that I have for this note. The same five companions of Paul listed here are also found in Colossians 4. This suggests that Philemon and Colossians were written at the same time, early 60s and from the same place. Mention of the same mail carrier named Onesimus in Philemon 10 and Colossians 4.9 also implies that Paul sent these letters to believers in the same region, that is Asia Minor. So again, the idea that this letter has been linked so well to Colossians Again, theoretically, someone writing Colossians, trying to pass it off as something like Paul, could have cribbed this. But, you know, so either he was very good at copying St. Paul, or what's the more likely answer? The more likely answer is that Colossians was written by St. Paul. Now, why don't people like to say that St. Paul wrote Colossians? I know this isn't directly on topic, but let's bring it up. Then we have 10 minutes. They like to say Colossians wasn't written by Paul because it has a very high view of Christ. It talks about how Christ is the one in whom the deity resides in full bodily form. Uh, and they tend to think, well, Paul wouldn't have had that obvious of an experience or understanding of Christ. It's a little too forward. That's something from later in the first century or early in the second century. And again, it's, it is clear that even Paul's writing gets clearer over time, and he comes to deeper understandings and, and puts things differently over time. Um, so you don't want to downplay that entirely. Again, we don't believe in inspiration the way Muslims do. This wasn't dictated by the Archangel Gabriel. Okay? Neither was the Quran. But, I mean, don't, okay, no one else follow up on that. Um, I, if I believed it did, I'd, I'd go become Muslim. I don't. I mean, no offense to anybody. Um, if you take it, that's on you. Anyway, to the point. The idea is that, you know, again, that there are human authors inspired by the divine author. 
And that's going to reflect the patterns of thought that the human author holds. So when, when they're trying to say, oh, Colossians wasn't written because these things seem more advanced than that, there is a point to that. There is a point to that when you consider, um, say, the Gospels, or you consider, is this an early letter of Paul or a late letter of Paul? But it's extending far beyond the data you have to say, oh, Paul definitely didn't write this. I think that's, that's pretty far um, to go. Okay? Questions, comments, concerns? Philemon, reconciliation. Um, undermining institutions without overturning them, totally transforming our identity in Christ. I think all of this is pretty relevant to us right now. Um, yeah, Larry. Yeah, I, I think that point that you make about our identity in Christ, which changes everything, um, twice in, in the letter, in verse uh, 7, he refers to Philemon as my brother. And that's in the beginning, and then towards the end, in verse 20, he says, yes, brother. Mm. And right in the middle, when he's sending Amimus back, Onesimus, oh, yeah. uh, he says, accept him not as a slave, but as a brother. Interesting. So all three of us are brothers together in Christ, and that changes the whole slave. I mean, it changes every human relationship we have once we're baptized into the body of Christ. Yeah. Yeah, and just to briefly restate that for internet world, simply that um, Larry just pointed out, and I think quite insightfully, that um, the transformation in Christ is alluded to at the beginning and end of the letter by Paul calling Philemon brother, and in the middle, and this is often the mentality, I think in our way of doing things, like in the West, you lay out what you're going to do, and then you repeat it at the end. For us, the important thing is how you start a speech, and how you end it. For the the ancient mindset, the important part is what you shove in the middle of it. That's the important part. So think of how the, the Ten Commandments are in like chapter 20 of the book of Exodus, or 24. They're not at the beginning, they're not at the end, they're right in the middle. The high point in, in much of the Old Testament and much of the New is in the middle. So again here, um, it seems Philemon's ready to recognize that he's St. Paul's brother, right? That part is uncontroversial for where he is. The controversial part is that um, Onesimus is his brother. And so uh, I think you pointed it out very well. Beginning and middle, uh, beginning and end, it's um, Paul calling Philemon, the, the would-be master, his brother. The middle, he's calling Onesimus Philemon's brother. And that's the challenge, and that's the, that's the meat of the sandwich right there. Great. Other comments, questions, concerns? We can also do a lightning round, though Marty's not here. I know she loves doing lightning rounds. <laughs> we haven't had one in six months, though, so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry that this um, this venue doesn't work as well as St. Joe's for you all, but I will relay that to the pastor, because again, he thought it would be better to be here because of the noon mass. That was his argument. And again, I'll present that to him, but you know, the, the mobility issues are one thing. The parking issue, I know, is another. Yeah, you all seem to be nodding, so I can say that this is the general consensus of the group. Is anyone in love with St. Mary's as the place to do this? Because I'll, I'll convey that to him, too. I think it would make him feel better if a couple people said that. We still have time if we come mass yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay. Why don't we open up to the lightning round then? Questions, comments, concerns about anything, right? This is the whole idea with Marty said, like people just bring their own questions or whatever's on the mind, and we talk about that. Yeah. This is normally where Marty for stuff. Yeah, Lee, you got something? Um, what's the um, your thought on the if it's happened they wear um the the, the, that non spoke, the, you know, Roman Catholic non spoke on the Republican National Conference. Yeah. Is that common, or is that, or did she get permission from above to do that? Or? I imagine she got permission from her superior. So the question was regarding uh, Sister Deirdre Byrne, who was the nun who spoke at the Republican National Convention back last month or two months ago. I don't keep yeah. Track. Last month. So, I mean, for something like that, you would need a superior, I mean, you ought to have a superior's permission for that. Um, there was a nun who spoke at the, the Democratic National Convention, too. Yeah. Um, you know, there, various people engage in various ways, and I'm trying to keep it vague because I'm trying not to come down in any particular way. But there is the tough line because, you know, the church, the church is free and ought to be free to speak frankly about the issues of our day. And some of those have political import, plenty of them do. But on the other hand, we can't confuse political with partisan. And I'm not accusing her of that, I'm not. I'm, I'm not weighing into what she particularly said. 
um, other than that abortion is wrong, which I shouldn't even need to say. Um, but no, I think that the church, and again, think back to what St. Paul said at the beginning of this. I I am bold enough to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake I prefer to appeal to you. I think generally with these political questions it's better to appeal um, to the questions. And there are some very pressing and real questions here. And the, the choice of who to vote for isn't black or white. There are dozens of parties out there, some of which are deliberately strict, structured around Catholic social teaching. I mean, they don't have a snowball's chance of, of getting an electoral vote. But again, the question, the question becomes, well, how, how does responsible citizenship get expressed at a time like this? And, um, you know, as several bishops have said, and, and plenty do, I mean, the most important issue of our time is, is preserving the right to life. And that doesn't downplay any of the other issues any more than um, when I made an allusion to before about how slavery exists on a spectrum with other unjust economic arrangements doesn't mean that slavery isn't uniquely heinous. Um, you know, it rather contextualizes that. And so the, the right to life has to contextualize how we preserve and safeguard the rights of others and make sure that their needs are getting met by society, not necessarily by government, though it can be done by government. See how vague I'm keeping it. I think I'm doing great so far. Um, but I bring all that up just because, no, there are real moral considerations here, and they really should be the primary thing that guides you how to vote. Yeah. Um, but I, I would be careful about saying that it tells you who you should vote for. I would think more it tells you who you shouldn't vote for. Um, that would be my, you know, again, some people talk about, about the lesser of two evils. And again, number one, there's not just two. There are dozens of, of votes out there. And I mean, I've sat out an election or two when I didn't think the candidates met what I would have expected. I, I, I've sat it out before. Well, that was always my standard, is to sit it out because either party or that will never work for me. And but I was given that some thought, like you said too, that that was a, a, more of a major issue, and that should be that's why it should be brought up and um, and, and again, rather than all the other yeah. things. I think there's a danger again with telling people who to vote for. And again, under tax law, we shouldn't. She didn't say, she didn't say no, no, she didn't. Yeah. Um, but she all but did. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, I was going to comment on what she said. Oh, um, but, but no, I mean, the fact is that, you know, we, we can't be ashamed to push our priorities and they take a political note. But again, I don't think it can identify with voting for a political, a particular candidate, because there are dozens of candidates who could live up to that set of priorities. And even a protest vote for a third party can say something. Again, I saw this comment. I saw this comment regarding someone was complaining about the 2000 election and how old Nader cost for the election. And someone pointed out, well, wait a minute. You know, they didn't have to choose between Bush and Gore. And then the, the 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 polls actually say that more Democrats voted for George W. Bush than voted for Ralph Nader, which is something that you know, again, you forget. But there's more crossover between the parties necessarily than from these third parties. Because if we look at it simply as that binary choice, which again, strategically, if you're looking to get your vote to help contribute to getting an electoral vote, that requires you to vote for one or two parties in our, in our situation. Unless you're in Utah with Evan McMullen, and even there it didn't work. So the point is just, but there are other ways you can vote. And, and that those also say something. Because no candidate has the right to your vote. Now, again, I think in some cases of particular importance, you have to paint it in a way of well, what's like most likely to limit damage. And there could be legitimate disagreement on that. But anyway, I know that I haven't clarified anything, but I hopefully have thrown out I some things out there that help you yeah, navigate. I don't want to bring it up. Yeah, because anything. again, telling people they can't that they that they have to vote for a certain candidate is gonna blow up in your face. And and it's you know, again, there's a bigger question. Just like this. It's a bigger question than whether slavery should be banned. Okay? Slavery was banned, and then we didn't treat people like brothers. <laughs> okay, so you know that doesn't fix it. <laughs> what fixes it is the transformation of mind and heart. Da, da, da. And I'm not saying that to downplay the importance of political process, but you know we have to do it in such a way that we're not responding to the political questions. We're transforming the political questions by how we choose to vote. And sometimes that means sitting it out and saying, "Well, you didn't prove you were worthy of my vote, so screw you." You know, for all I care, rot electorally, electorally, not anything. Else. Anyone else? Okay. We're going again. Um, you had a throwaway comment about Leviticus a couple of weeks back that's been in my mind. Um, it was about how the people have not just an obligation, but also a right to proper worship. How far does that right actually extend? Because that's been time in dioceses where like, you complain to the bishop, the bishop, he's, he's for liturgical abuse. So what? The bishop is for it? 
um, in your in your. And again, I'm not going to get into any particulars because I'm online. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, again, I think the issue with rights is that it's a shorthand way of saying the way things should be, reflective of the dignity and the identity of the people involved. So the issue is rights often come shorthand for this is the way it has to happen. And again, that's, that's a fair circumlocution. It's a fair way of getting to the heart of what's actually at issue. But the issue becomes, it's, it's not simply like what your rights are under law as something to be dispensed to you in an automatic way. So again, I think it's an absolute imperative. And I would think it's um, the bishop who is chief liturgist of his diocese, I would think it's his absolute imperative to do something like that. My priorities would probably be different from some if they asked me what I would prefer. I would prefer to have places not have mass than have it if it were, you know, sufficiently distorted. What kind of examples are the liturgical views? <sighs> if you're playing around with the texts a lot, I mean, certainly we had the issue recently of that deacon who found out he wasn't validly baptized because the deacon played around with the formula of baptism. Um, Again, though I have issues with, with how that went, but I accept it, it has its authority, but I, I think it's a bit strict to say it was certainly invalid. But, I mean, I, I would understand why you would want to have that baptism repeated and everything else. Anyway, uh, I, and I'm not downplaying or denying the, the decision the Vatican came to. I just think that the, the strictness with which they came to it um, makes you question a lot of other things. That's all. Back to the point. I'm really on camera. I shouldn't be talking this way. Um... So I think that people play around with the matter. I, I would think um, picking music that's proper to mass, I think that's one of the biggest scandals is that um, there's that. Now, on the other hand, you don't want to ride into town and just overturn the apple cart on people. Because people have grown attached to things and you have to kind of wean them off it. But on the other hand, um, you know, um, so much of what was called for over the past hundred years for the liturgical reform of music hasn't been implemented. And people come to me, um, they come to plenty of priests and they say, I can go to daily mass, but Sunday mass drives me nuts because they're often in places where they find the music atrocious, and and you know they'll seek out a mass without singing because it's less painful to them than the music that they put for the sacred song, and and so again I think we have to respect the people who for whatever reason find that music uplifting even though they don't understand necessarily that it's not fitting to mass, and again for people like that you know they feel guilty sometimes they don't go to their own parish and I go well, look you have to go where you're fed you can't just go where where you're miserable, um, you shouldn't feel like something like that. Um, so things like that, I think, and again, the issue is with regard to rights, it becomes less, church law doesn't make it so actionable to deal with in, in such a direct way. Mm -hmm. But I think, I brought it up in that way, I think, so that people who are putting up with this can speak with the authority that they have. Because you do have an authority to say, look, I'm not being fed here. Now, I think that should be done humbly. I think that shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't be acting like you just came down off of Sinai because you didn't. And again, maybe your priorities are distorted. I don't know. Um, not accusing you, but you know, I'm just saying. Like we all have, I have preferences that aren't are sometimes arbitrary. You know, ooh, I'm sure that doesn't surprise you at all. Uh, but just to say, like we all have that to a degree. But the question becomes when things aren't really being done in a way that represents what you were expecting coming in. You know, if, if you go to McDonald's and you get a Whopper instead of a Big Mac, I mean, you can, I think you can tell them, hey, I don't, I don't think you're doing your job. I don't think that's that's not arrogant. That's not arrogant to say. Maybe you can use some of that argument that Father John Paul about moving the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> oh Lord! That that is a way one could put it, and I'm being recorded right now. But, <laughs> but better yet, it's an argument you can make with the pastor. Well, no, I, I was thinking. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Fit in that category. Huh? Well, again, I, I don't think there's you know. There's no right to have a Bible study at St. Joseph's. There's no right to have a Bible study here. You know, it's we, we judge this apropos and whatnot. But I think, you know, the access of the faithful would make an argument for why you do it in a place that's more accessible rather than less. I understood. Fine. But this is where the this is where the issue of rights can become difficult because then it becomes, well, if you don't move it to St. Joseph's, or if you don't do worship the way I'm expecting, you're denying my rights. And, and, it, and, it, and the temperature heats up very quickly, and it throws heat rather than light, and you don't actually work out what's actually at issue. And, and the problem is, when we're talking about things regarding liturgy and what's fitting to the worship of God, we're talking often about matters of taste, some of which, you know, when you look at some people's matter, matter of taste, like, it's atrocious. They don't have any taste. But there's the old Latin phrase, de gustibus non desputandum est. The matters of taste are, cannot be debated. 
you know, oh, that jacket looks awful. Uh, you know, I mean, that's that's a statement. You can't really argue that out. You basically laugh at the person until he comes to see that it looks ridiculous. <laughs> that's all you can do. And, and if he insists that, and, and that it looks great, well, you're going to be at an impasse. And so this is where I think um, St. Paul with Philemon sets a good standard, where it no longer becomes what you're dictating based on what you perceive your rights to be. It becomes rather... Um, what is actually edifying and refreshing for people? And, and when you go to something, if you're in an experience where you come out, I mean, Ken, I've been to masses where I came out more exhausted than I went in, especially when I was a layman. Now that I'm a priest, I think I generally enjoy them, but, um, you know, but I, but I pick what I like. So, but just to say, right, like there are times where you can say, look, you're, this isn't building me up or this isn't working for me. Um, so again, it's, it's tough. It's tough. Um, but, I think over time, I think the, that there's a vision toward reclaiming what we've always held. There's a vision toward holding something and, and preserving our tradition um, in a proper and balanced sense. But I think it's going to take a little longer. I think on the whole, things are a lot better than they were. Um, and again, I think, yeah, I think you have to bear patiently in, in an understanding way, but not afraid just to point out when you don't think something's working. That would be my answer. Vague. I hope it's vague enough that I don't get in trouble. Larry. I think the other thing we have to keep in mind is that this is, as Paul here in Philemon, he said he had the right to command, but he wanted to appeal. And he said he was doing that for love's sake. So when we think about our rights and all these other issues where we are expecting or demanding something, we always have to think about where does love come from. Yeah. Where is that in the relationship within the church, within the context of brothers and sisters? And, and the basis of, so, so the comment was basically that, um, you know, commanding has to, has to be understood with regard to love. And that the, the invitation to love and, and, and um, affability of, of, of yielding is better than insisting on your rights. Um, I think one thing that's worth pointing out with that also is that whenever we seek to correct someone, I mean, this is something that you learn pretty early on in religious life, and I'm sure you learn it in marriage too. But, you know, when you correct someone, you have to do it with the expectation that it's actually going to help the situation. It can't just be, I don't like this. Like, it has to be, I don't like this, what can we do about it? Or, I don't like this, I think you're going to help me do something about it, right? It's not just, I don't like this about you, I don't like that about you. You have gap teeth, you have a lisp. Like, like <laughs> then it's just you're tearing someone down. And then, like, what, what are you doing, right? It has to be what you can work on together, right? And so going into a place and saying you don't do enough Gregorian chant, well, they, they don't have a music director who's able to do it. So why are you, you know, why are you going in with that? And if you don't have a dynamic with the pastor where you've been able to tell him about the things you appreciate, why is he going to be so eager to hear you when the first words out of your mouth are a complaint about what isn't being done? You know, like, like again, the charity, the charity is the way that, that helps us express our rights in a proper and balanced way. And the primary thing we should be doing is, is trying to help move things to the point of it, right? Like the right to proper worship. Well, you want better music, but are you willing to sing in the choir? You know, are, are you paying the check so that they can hire, you know, a professional musician is 150 bucks a mass. Are, are you, who's cutting that check? You know, so again, I'm not putting any of you on the spot about it here. I think we have things great here. But when you talk about, well, what, what are our rights and how can we move things along? Well, how are you helping midwife the new solution along? Or are you just saying, hey, why isn't this kid here yet? <laughs> you know, I mean, forgive the odd analogy, but that's kind of what we're talking We're talking about something just as sensitive as birthing a baby. Less dangerous, of course. Um, okay, you want to leave it there? Look on the other side, you have people say, I love to go to St. Mary's because of the music. And it's more people than the one Oh, sure. Oh, sure. So the comment was simply that the music's great here, which is absolutely true. Um, whether you go to Mass at St. Joe's or St. Mary's, the music is wonderful. This isn't a complaint session about the parish, Father John Paul. Um, but, but no, it's about the wider question, right? And, and again, people often drive past places to come to our parish visits in there. You know, um, you know, sometimes I don't know why, but yeah, they do. Um, and, and so, yeah, it's a question of, and again, looking to, well, what can you do in the place you are at to help make it just a bit better? You know? Like in your marriage, it's like, well, what can you do this week to show you care a bit more or to build it up? You know? But I'm just a romantic, I guess. Okay. 
Yeah. You know what I want to call it there? Well, you know, they might not um, have heat at St. Joseph's, you know. <laughs> I think so. oh. I have to be careful if we go right. here. They might not have heat. No, I mean, enough for that, because if this building is already heated. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's open It's open a few days a week. Um, it's being open all day right now. Yeah. Um, so it's open from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. each day. Yeah. And as the guy who heard confessions, I have to remember to go close it at 7 p.m. We'll see if I do or not. There have been times I go in at like 11 o'clock at night. I'm like, what? I forget. It's not my job. Well, it is my job. Look. I'm, I'm here to be a priest. The rest of it's extra. Okay. Anything else? Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, the world without end. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Thank you all. Thank you, Internet world. Sorry, Dennis, we're done. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Thank you all for coming out for the inaugural one. Oh, by the way, um, I'm on retreat next week. I'm on retreat next week, so we're not doing this. Okay. If I find an internet connection, I'll do something in exile. But if not, just say some prayers for me. I'm going to the Maronite Monastery up in Massachusetts. Okay.